I can't invite you back to your chairs and to find your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take one of the Bibles provided at the back table there to help you to follow along as we study this passage in Ephesians this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, continuing into the second half of the book of Ephesians, which is about our response as a church, as a body, to the gospel that Paul has described in the first three chapters, filled with gold pieces of scriptural truth throughout these last three chapters of Ephesians. We're going to look at verses 7 through 13 this week. Verse 7 through 13. So let's read that together. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 13. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ. When I was a little boy, my dad was a band director. My dad was a musician and my mom was a musician. We grew up in a very musical family. My dad, for a while after college, worked as a band director. And so I have vague, vague memories. I was very young, vague memories of, of getting to be a part of the band practices, sort of watch as a little boy and I, I would imagine, since my dad loves youth and teenagers, and that he was a really great band director, I imagine the kids mostly loved him. Um, but a band director has a, has a difficult job, because if you can imagine, uh, you're trying to coordinate uh, a host of different instruments and different schedules and bring them all into the field uh, to become something of a harmonious unity. They have to move. They're in the middle of a, a busyness. Uh, as they're playing because they're on the field usually and so forth. And, and so when I was growing up and the, the Macy's Day Parade or so forth would come on, uh, we were always treated to expert diagnosis uh, for how effective these bands actually were. Um, and I, I wouldn't have known otherwise. But a, a band director, uh, it would be true also of a, of a, a person leading an orchestra, uh, they have to ensure that each individual has what they need so that the band can produce as a whole what it's intended to produce. So if you can imagine a, a bad band director would be one who would, who would pick one kid out of a class, take them into the field, sit them down and say, now go, be a marching band. Be what you're supposed to be. Be all that you can be as a marching band. Be a horrible band director because that one person simply can't be what a band is supposed to be. A band director has to ensure that that person has fellow band members and has to make sure that each band member has individual training. You can't just train them in the band aspect. You have to train them in their individual contribution. Make sure they have teachers and ensure that the teachers are training each of them individually. It's no good just to have a person out there with a drum. They have to know how to play drum. Can't just have a person out there with a, a trumpet. They have to know how to play trumpet. You, you have to have individual training and coordination and a sense of unity. That's, that's what a, a good band director does. And this passage is about the ultimate band director, the ultimate coordinator, the one who ensures that, that his orchestra, his, his body has all that they need to be together who God has called them to be. He, he has provided everything that they can need, individual training, a unity, a part to play, 
There's a, a sense of lavish generosity where he's provided all that they need. They show up to the field and discover there's training available and there's people for every different part to play available. And he's there to ensure all that you need to be who I've called you to be. And not only that, but, but I've, I've written a piece for you that's going to showcase everything that you're called to be. That's what this passage describes Jesus as being for his church. You notice the emphasis on the word gave. He gave, it says. He gave. He gave to each one, and he gave leaders in the church, and he gave a goal for what they were to become. The emphasis in this passage is on the generosity of the Lord Jesus for the growth of his church. And I think what we're supposed to take out of this passage is a certain delight, a, a certain awe, a gratefulness and appreciation such that we would fulfill what he has provided. Delight in the generosity of Jesus Christ for the growth of his church. That's how I would summarize these verses. Delight. Delight in the generosity of Jesus for the growth of his church. He hasn't just thrown us into a field and said, go be a band. No, he's given everything that is needed for the church to be together what God has called us to be. Delight. Delight, Paul would say. Check it out, Paul would say. Have you seen what Jesus has given to his church so that they can be the body God has called them to be? Delight in the generosity of Jesus Christ for the growth of his church. Let's walk through the passage. First point I would make to summarize the first few verses here is the giving Savior. The giving Savior. Paul has been, as I said, turning the corner from the instruction in the gospel and the purpose of the church to the calling of the church to respond in a manner worthy of the grace they have received. He's talked about the unity, their love for one another. And he talked last, last week, we looked at this verse where he just, in, in repeated staccato style, says, remember your unity is built. You're one body. You have one spirit, one faith, one baptism. All this unifying language. All of these things you have together in common. The most important things about you, you share with every other Christian, Paul would say. But he also wants them to know this is not a, a, faithless, a, a faceless unity. This unity has individual contributions. Not, not every Christian uh, is, is unknown or anonymous to Paul. And so he turns the corner in verse 7, and the emphasis here is in this one body, each one has a part to play. The Savior has not only ensured that the body as a whole has a part to play or a unity, he's ensured that each one is a part of that whole. You notice that in verse 7 if you look down there. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Paul is, is bringing the other side of our unity. He's saying our unity that we have in the Lord is fulfilled as each one of us play the part that God has given that one to play in the church. This is not a passive unity. It's an active unity. It's not a homogenous unity. It's a diverse unity. It's a unity where each one is given a measure of grace to contribute to the body. I think the emphasis here is on the, the generosity of the Savior to ensure that each Christian has been given. You notice there in verse 7, each Christian has been given a measure of grace to contribute to the body. The, the passage is not concerned with making sure everyone feels like they're equal in the body. I think that's the point of that phrase, according to the measure of Christ's gift. It basically says, it's up to him what measure of grace we're given to give to the body. But we're not to be competitive in that sense. It's not that we, are have, we all have equal strengths or equal abilities, but we have equally a calling and a gift to give. A strength and enabling grace to contribute to the body. The giving Savior has given each Christian a contribution to make to the church. There is no unity in the church apart from each one contributing, Paul would say. John Calvin describes this passage this way. He says, He, Paul, now describes the manner in which God establishes and preserves among us a mutual revelation. No member of the body of Christ is endowed with such perfection as to be able, without the assistance of others, to supply his own necessities. A certain proportion is allotted to each, 
And it is only by communicating with each other that all enjoy what is sufficient for maintaining their respective places in the body. Such a diversity is so far from injuring that it tends to promote and strengthen the harmony of believers. The meaning of this verse may thus be summed up. On no one has God bestowed all things. Each has received a certain measure. Being thus dependent on each other, they find it necessary to throw their individual gifts in the common stock and thus to render mutual aid. The words grace and gift remind us that whatever may be our attainments, we ought not to be proud of them because they lay us under deeper obligations to God. Now, Paul, after describing that each one has received a gift, emphasizes who the giver is. So he has this passage here where he says, uh, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And then he describes in this parenthetical phrase in saying he ascended, what did it mean? But that he had also descended. And the one who descended is the one who ascended far above all that he might fill all things. So let's put these pieces together. Paul quotes the Old Testament. There's this image of a, a military victory where the king returns from, from victory and he has conquered, he has established a, a victory. And a result of that victory, Paul says in Christ, is that gifts are given, a, a sort of bounty is poured out on his people. So the image Paul has in mind is of Jesus conquering through his cross and resurrection. And then as a result of that, bountifully pouring out provision to each of his people to fulfill or display that victory in their unity to one another. And he reminds them that the very reason he had to ascend is that he descended. And we know what he descended to do. He descended to die for the church. So the emphasis on this is just the giving of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave by descending into the lower parts. I think that's describing his incarnation and his death and his descent into the grave. And then he ascended in victory, but his giving didn't stop by dying for sinners. His giving continued in pouring out on them a, a strength or a grace to fulfill what he had died to accomplish. Incredible emphasis on the generosity of the Lord Jesus here. He gave to each one. He didn't miss a name in his distribution of strength to fulfill what he had died to produce in the church. And remember, he ascended as the conquering king who had conquered death and sin and, and the devil. And, and then he, he lavishes on his people the gifts so that they can fulfill what he had achieved. We tie all this together, I think we could say that our individual contributions to each other and our dependence on the contributions of others to us displays the victorious generosity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It makes encouraging your brother on Sunday morning a bigger deal. It makes your contribution to that next small group meeting a bigger deal. It makes your offer of hospitality a bigger deal. It makes your correction of the wandering sister who's running away from the Lord a bigger deal. It makes your encouragement of the, the sorrowful brother a bigger deal. It makes your insight about a passage that you study in small group a bigger deal. What's it doing? It's displaying the generosity of a victorious Savior. Church is not ultimately about the people in the church or even about the people outside the church. It's ultimately about displaying the generosity of the king who descended and rose in victory. It motivates us. It motivates us in, in our individual contributions that we neither minimize nor maximize the purpose of our contribution in the life of the church. We don't minimize it because the Savior gave to each something to give, something to contribute. We don't maximize it because it's about his generosity. He gave it to us. We pass on what we received. The generous Savior should be on display every time a Christian has an opportunity to receive from or to give to 
some strength, some encouragement in the Christian walk, whether it's practical or spiritual. Paul's going to get later to speaking the truth in love and building up one another and forgiving one another and expressing patience to one another. All of the ways that Christians live life together and their individual contributions one to another display the generosity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me motivate us just in one practical application for our church. When you think about, about small group meetings or men's meetings or women's meetings, churches do that different. We, we've tried to organize different kinds of meetings. We understand people have, have children. It's hard to get child care. And so we try to create a number of meetings that people could go to uh, even if they can't get child care for their children. So the guys could go to the men's meeting. Ladies go to the women's meeting. We have family meetings. The whole family can come. And we have adult meetings. Certainly one spouse or the other can go to those at times. But we sometimes as Christians feel that, that these kinds of gatherings are, are, are not as, um, <laughs> we, we don't receive as much from them as you do come into a, a big church meeting where you have a, a, a full-time pastor speaking or you have a big band and everything. But, but the point we need to feel in these moments is, no, no, remember, remember, we are called to build up. The church is called to display individually the well-being of our brothers and sisters. I need to receive, not just from a a called pastor or a worship leader or somebody gifted in, in this particular way. I need to receive from individual Christians. God has given each one something to display his generosity and his victory is seen in the most minute moments of small group fellowship and encouragement and hospitality and giving and love and encouragement and correction. That's the victory of Jesus on display. The giving Savior. First section. Then then Paul transitions and starts talking about a, a specific kind or category of gift that he has given to the church. You notice on there in verse 11 it says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. So he transitions from each one has been given something to give. I love that he starts there. He doesn't start with the, the, the called leadership of the church. He starts with the fact that every Christian is called to give. But then he, he transitions to a particular means of the benefit of the church. We might label these uh, the messengers of the church. These seem to be men who are, are called in a, a capacity, in an office even, a role. This is not uh, simply individual Christians giving to one another. There's a kind of a a calling that's associated here, a a ministerial calling. And he says there's there's different kinds of ministerial calling. And so he lists them, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And that all of those roles have this goal of equipping the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. One point about the goal of full-time or called ministry, and then one thing about the ministry itself. Notice there that the role of ministers, of whatever variety they are, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, their role is not to do all the ministry of the church. You notice that in the passage? Obvious in that every Christian is called to minister. Their role is to equip, to equip the saints so that the saints can do the work of ministry. So we connect this to the previous verses by saying every Christian has something to contribute. God has given called men to the church to equip and train and provide the resources necessary so that those Christians can work the ministry of the Lord toward one another and build up the body of Christ. You see how it it works there? In a similar way, A band director isn't the band. Even a leader of a section isn't the band. But they can certainly equip and train. In this passage, you might think of of the pastor, teacher, all these other role positions, almost as though what their job is 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 as a teacher of a section or a particular type of instrument. They're teaching that person to to play their role. They're providing them the training. They're providing them the resources. They're explaining their their job and the difficulty of it. Not not because they're going to go out and replace them on the field, but so that they can go and do their work of ministry and build up the body 
That's the role of these ministers is to equip, to train, to provide resources, spiritual resources and and vision and insight and passion and motivation so that these individual Christians who have each been given strength can go and build up the body of Christ, Paul says. So there's a gift of messengers. Again, all displaying the generosity of the Lord. He gives power to each to serve and then he gives leaders to equip those so that they can be effective in their service. Now, a few minutes about the roles of these messengers. You notice he lists four or five of them, apostles, prophets, evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Those last two are linked by the same definite article, the. And so scholars dispute, is that pastors and teachers? Is it pastor teachers? Uh, It's a little difficult to discern. I think probably there are certain men in the church who are called to teach, and certainly all pastors are called to teach. And so there's this accent or emphasis on a role in the church of pastoring, shepherding, the spiritual well-being of the church, and also a role of teaching that they fulfill and possibly others fulfill as well in the church. To go backwards, we look at the first role, apostles there. The vast majority of the use of that word for designating a role describes Jesus and his 12 apostles, or it references the Apostle Paul. So in Scripture, we we seem to have three different ways that the word apostle is used. One is in a a technical, a non-repeatable sense, in which there's these unique, unrepeatable roles, the 12 apostles of Jesus, the Apostle Paul, Many of these men wrote scripture. They traveled with Jesus. They saw him in his resurrected glory. We don't believe that, that those kind of apostles existed after the first century. There's also in the, in the scriptures a, what you might call a semi-technical sense of the use of the word apostle. It's, it's used, we think, of, of the man named Apollos who preached. It's, it's used also of Barnabas. And they didn't seem to quite be in the first group, but they had this role of planting and nurturing churches and serving churches and, and building up the body. They did not have some kind of infallible authority. And I think it's possible that there are still men like that that God uses in the church. I don't think they have some kind of absolute authority over churches, but just a gifting to serve and and equip pastors and to serve pastors and to to help plant churches and sort of provide a leadership in the mission of the church. I I don't think personally that there's there's no such men like that in history. I think we've seen that throughout history, men who function in that sort of way, yet without anything like the authority that, that Paul and the others exercised. I think that Actually, all of these roles function in an ongoing way of the church partially because of, you look down in verse 13, it says these roles were given until, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. So I, I don't think there's a good case to be made that these roles conclude or end or that the church reaches a point at which it no longer needs pastors or these other kinds of roles in the church. I think they're an ongoing need in the church. Probably the prophets referenced here were were men that were given prophetic words. We we read about Agabus in Acts, how he was given prophetic insight into Paul's ministry. It doesn't compete with, it's not on par with Scripture. But just God gives them insight into a a certain situation, like Agabus was able to to say Paul's going to be imprisoned. Probably that re- speaks to that. It may also speak to, to men, as it talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, who are just given a, words of unusual anointing and encouragement in the church. May have that role in mind. We, we don't have a lot of information about these roles. Evangelist probably refers to a person who just dedicated his life to reaching unbelievers and, and inspiring and training the church in, in the reaching of unbelievers. Philip is described as an evangelist in the book of Acts, and so... He, he seems to be a man who just dedicated himself to, to reaching out to unbelievers and leading the church in that endeavor. Obviously, pastors and teachers. Pa- pastors has this role of caring for the spiritual well-being. It, it comes from the, the flock imagery of a shepherd caring for the well-being of the flock. And obviously, teachers proclaim the truth of God's word in season and out of season, Paul says. The point for all of us is the means by which the church is 
prepared and trained and inspired and motivated to fulfill their task of building up the body is the gift of called and qualified leaders in the church. So there is this gift of messengers in the church. The church is not intended to be leaderless or messengerless. There is not an extreme uh, sort of egalitarianism in the church where all teach alike. There is this role of equipping that's given to people in the church. John Calvin again says this, If the edification of the church proceeds from Christ alone, he has surely a right to prescribe in what manner it shall be edified. But Paul expressly states that according to the command of Christ, no real union or perfection is attained but by the outward preaching. We must allow ourselves to be ruled and taught by men. This is the universal rule which extends equally to the highest and to the lowest. The church is the common mother of all the godly which bears, nourishes, and brings up children to God, kings and peasants alike. And this is done by the ministry. Those who neglect or despise this order choose to be wiser than Christ. Woe to the pride of such men! It is no doubt a thing in itself possible that divine influence alone should make us perfect without human assistance. But the present inquiry is not what the power of God can accomplish, but what is the will of God and the appointment of Christ. A few comments about the Christian ministry and I have it primarily in view pastoral ministry. Certainly it would apply to anyone in an evangelistic role or anyone serving in any kind of Christian ministry, really. But it, it's important to, to look here and, and take some, some points, take stock a little bit of, of how we can apply what Jesus is saying here. Since these messengers are given by the Lord to the church, they, the messengers should be humble men. They haven't <laughs> taken this office for themselves. They haven't attained to something through their excellence or through their greater worth. They've been given a stewardship by the Lord, so they should be humble men, humbled by the calling to serve the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Since they are given by the Lord who descended in order to save, they should be servants, not lording it over, but eager to lay their life down for the sake of God's people, serving sacrificially and eagerly and humbly and joyfully. And since they are given by the Lord, they should be received with, with gratefulness and support by the church. It's intentional that their humility and servant-heartedness should be accented first. I think a pastor should read this and be humbled by it. The church should not feel obligated to support and listen to any man who claims an office for himself. Should not feel obligated. But the church should, under the guidance of the Spirit, discern those men whom the Lord has genuinely called by their unswerving allegiance to the Word and their servant-hearted character, and such men should be seen as the gift of the Lord and should result in gratefulness to God. It's the task of every Christian to discern where are these gifts described in Ephesians. It's one of the reasons when, when people um, move to a new town or move, go to college and, and move away, one of the things I encourage them to do, don't just attend a church. Uh, have a conversation with a pastor. It won't take you very long. But I think you'll be able to discern fairly quickly, is this a person called to bring God's word into the life of his church? I, I think you'll be able to discern fairly quickly if, if there's a, a humility there or a pride or a self-centeredness or an arrogance, if there's a, a faithfulness to the gospel. It, it won't take you very long. Don't, don't just, just walk in and get, get to ask this, this person how... How has God met you as a Christian? Talk to me about your calling. Why do you want to be a pastor? 
I would encourage Christians to do that. I, I encourage, when people come and visit our church, I, I always want to let them know, look, I, I would love to meet with you. I understand it's hard to look for a church. I, I, would, I would welcome anything you want to ask about me. You're welcome to ask. I, I don't assume that you want to come listen to me every week. I mean, come, come have lunch and, and ask me any questions you want. And if you don't like the answer, I totally understand. I, I respect you for investigating the person you're going to sit under week after week. I would encourage you to do that. I would encourage you to, to ask questions and find out and decide. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about or, or he's not humble or he doesn't love the Lord. Obviously, no pastor is perfect, especially in this church. No pastor is perfect. There's weaknesses and failures and pastors stumble. But there should be this sense that what it says in the passage is reflected in the pulpit and in private. This is a person called by the Lord to build up the church. This passage invites us to delight in the generosity of the Lord Jesus to his church. I do think in our culture, there is something of a, an anti-leadership move or bent or disposition. And we need to hear from John Calvin as he speaks across the centuries and say, no, there is a, there is a gift of the Lord in, in calling people to raise up and to, to equip and to inspire the church. That's not dangerous. That's the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ as long as it's done humbly and according to Scripture. I want to say, on behalf of Aaron, that we love being your pastors. We feel that you make it a joy to pastor. I feel badly for pastors that don't get to pastor in this church, that don't receive the kind of encouragement and blessing and patience and long-suffering and willingness to bear with that you exercise towards us. I, I, I'm more encouraged in a given year than, than many pastors will ever be. You make it easy to pastor. I think that you, you do rejoice in the Lord in this particular doctrinal truth about pastoral ministry. You must, because why would you be so excited about us if you didn't? So I, I'm, I'm grateful to you. I want you to know I think this is a strength in our church. I think it brings glory to the Lord, because he's the one who gives. Finally, the goal of maturity. All of, all of this giving, this provision, is not simply to be watched at and looked at at home or meditated on in private. There's a purpose, Paul says. The purpose of the giving to each one, the purpose of the provision of, of leaders to train and equip, is so that we would attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Imagine again, the band that receives training and is gathered on the field, but then has nothing to play and no one to play it for. Not so with the Christian church. Paul says, oh, we have a magnificent peace for you, a magnificent goal. There's going to be one day a perfected unity of the faith. We're all to fight for unity now. But one day there's going to be a, a perfect unity of the faith and a perfect knowledge of the Son of God so that all the truth of the gospel will be perfectly known and seen in his church. And we're progressing towards that goal imperfectly until he returns. But we're aiming for it. We're aiming, just like a band on the field. They never quite get it right yet. But man, they're getting closer and closer to revealing this goal. Mature manhood has this illustration that there are, there are children that, that are intended by God to grow up into the stature of adulthood. It's going to say in the verse next week that we don't want to remain as children, just susceptible to every doctrine and religious whim. We want to grow up in the Lord, Paul says. And then the astonishing phrase that ends this section, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
That's the goal. That's the purpose that Paul has out in front of the church. He's saying, look, I've given each of you strength, and this reveals my victorious generosity, and I've given the leaders and trainers to equip you along the way and to help you. But the goal of this is so that there would be this, this perfected bride that would be unified in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They would not be children. They would have grown up into Christian adulthood, and, and that adulthood would reflect the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Think about that phrase. The church is to reflect the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, we never reflect him in his deity, but somehow in his righteousness and the glory that he has as God's servant, the church is to reflect that stature. It's one of those phrases in Scripture that you almost feel is, is almost scandalous if it wasn't written in the Bible. The church is called to live up to, we might say, the Savior that saved them, the measure of the fullness of Christ. If, if, if there's a, a verse here that crushes status quo Christianity, this is it. Plateau Christianity get sufficiently mature and then turn off the, the growth engines. This is it. We, we don't stop growing in the knowledge of the gospel and the unity of the faith until we have measured up to or lived in keeping with the one who saved us. His righteous stature as our Savior is the standard of how we should reflect him as a church. It shouldn't condemn us. It should motivate us. There's more we can do to know the gospel, to love one another, to, to grow in the faith, to increase in our knowledge of the word, to, to help one another, to, to, to press on for the goal of the Lord Jesus Christ. The generosity of the Lord is not just in giving each or giving trainers to train, but in giving a magnificent goal to aim for. Church, the Lord Jesus has given us as a church a goal, a purpose. We have a mission. We are to keep striving for unity, the knowledge of what he's done and who he is as the son of God. And until we can say that we have measured up to the fullness of who he is and our accurate reflection of him, then we have more to do. We were just praying this morning in prayer. We, we pray through the membership directory in our corporate prayer, which you're invited to on Sunday mornings. We pray for a few names each week. And I was praying for someone this morning who's been a Christian for decades, member of our church. And, and praying for them, I pray, Lord, help them to, to not give in to the temptation to plateau. Not because I think they are, but because I, I understand that temptation. You, you reach a certain point in your Christian life and you feel like, I think I've, I, I'm avoiding killing people and, you know, I haven't run over anybody recently and I'm, I'm basically a good person. You know, mostly we don't fight too often in the house and I haven't stolen anything recently and you feel like I'm, I'm pretty good. I go to church and I avoid criminal activity and that's basically the standard that Jesus has for his church. The Bible says, no, no, look at Jesus. That's the standard that he has for his church. Now the marvelous thing about this passage is wouldn't have, <laughs> would it have been discouraging if he starts there? Measure up. Measure up to Jesus. That's the role of the church. Measure up. But he begins by saying he gave. He gave each one. Everyone dependent on everyone else. And he gave leaders to help. A and he provided different kinds of, of leaders in the church. Different kinds of, of called ministers that serve and equip. And, and, and he, he's given this so that you can actually one day when he returns reach this goal and always strive for it until he returns. Ephesians has this magnificent vision for the purpose of the church of God. It's not anonymous attendance on Sunday mornings. It's not occasional get-togethers. It's a passionate vision that can only be accomplished with one another so that every member of that band is concerned about every other member because if all you have is one trumpet player, you don't have a marching band. 
if all you have is a great drummer, you're going to miss a lot on the field when game day comes. Every member is concerned about their own contribution and the contribution of others and, and helping all of us together reach what God has intended us to be. So that the victorious generosity of the risen Savior can be displayed. It's displayed as the church receives from him and reflects that generosity toward one another. I've been told that somebody in the band, when my dad was band director, sewed me a little band outfit. There's probably pictures of this somewhere. It would be humbling. Sewed me a little band outfit, so I'm three years old or whatever. And, and that I would go out there in the field and be there with the drummers and watch them and just get into the, the band. And I'm going to be this little mascot for the band. It's so exciting. And I'm sure for me, it was this immense sense of privilege. I'm on the field. I'm with the band. I'm part of this. I wasn't contributing much. But I was excited about it. My prayer is that something of that childlike privilege to be a part of this. Probably not contributing much. But as I grow, I'll contribute more. But I want to be a part of this. It's his body. He's got plans for it. He's got a purpose for it. He's watching. He's listening. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful to you. Lord, receive our gratefulness. You have given far beyond what we could ask or imagine. You've given each of us a, a contribution to make. And you've called each of us to receive. And Lord, all of us over the years, Lord, have benefited from ministers that have, have taught us God's word and, and trained us in your truth. But I, I thank you for all of the pastors represented in this room. Oh, we're just a young church, Lord. There's many pastors that have fed your word over many decades represented in this room. Wherever they are now, Lord, bless those men. Give them a sense of their future reward and their work bearing fruit, Lord. And we pray you would raise up ministers for your gospel in this church. We pray, Lord, for evangelists with a heart towards the lost. Lord, I pray for those that have a heart to plant churches and care for pastors. I pray for men who have just insight into your word in a profound, encouraging way. Pastors who love your people, would you raise them up in this church? Raise up the next generation of gospel ministry. Lord, cause us to have faith and joy to press on together for the goal you've called us to. I pray that for our church. Lord, we're all distracted, tempted, drawn away, drawn towards individual pursuits. But Lord, call us into this incredible role you've given us as a part of your, your chorus, your sympathy, Lord. We thank you, Father. Receive the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.